In this section, we're going to introduce the concept of market power and we're going to focus on barriers to entry. Many people look at the perfect competition model and say, hey, that's wonderful. I mean, you can think of the theory of the firm where in the long run, there's no producer surplus and consumers reap all of the surplus from innovations from firms copying each other. And we have price takers out there and it's very competitive and we move markets forward and we have all of this efficiency. Everything clears and prices are as low as possible. But then they say, that's nice, that model's great. But the world isn't all perfect competition. In fact, most of the world around us is nothing like that. We worry about the power of firms, the man holding us down, monopoly power, keeping us regular Joes in check. We've got to think about fighting that power to get a good economic system for all. And so we worry about market power a great deal. And to introduce that idea, we have to think about, well, how do we get market power? And that's the idea of barriers to entry. Market power is a firm's ability to influence the market price of its product. We're no longer just a price taker. We can strategically set our price and try and get some surplus for the producer within that market. A key element of sustainable market power is that there must be something that keeps other competitors from entering and taking up that surplus, undercutting our prices and not allowing us to keep the power and the surplus of the situation where we have market power. Barriers to entry are factors that prevent these entrants despite having that large producer surplus to entice other people to want to come into that market. There are different types of barriers to entry and that is what we will cover here. The first type of barrier to entry that we can think of is a natural monopoly. Here with a natural monopoly, we have an average total cost curve that is always sloping down. In other words, the bigger the firm, the lower the average total cost. These types of situations would be pretty rare. We have extreme scale economies here with the firm growing in its production output. It has to have a situation where its cost, its average total cost is decreasing. We can think of this as a situation where there's a really big upfront fixed cost and then slowly rising or even decreasing or constant marginal costs from there on after. Then from a production standpoint, it's actually efficient for society if a single firm produces the output because with each additional unit produced, it's actually cheaper for it to be within this one big firm as the costs are decreasing with more and more output as opposed to having multiple firms produce in this situation. So if you were starting up against a natural monopoly, you trying to challenge them, your first few units would be very expensive, very costly for you to produce. Whereas if they wanted to produce those units and they had already produced millions of units of production, their producing the next few units would be very cheap because they are further along their average total cost curve and it's downward sloping. We can think of sometimes uh, considering big public utilities, electric, water, things like that as a natural monopoly. Some economists will make that kind of argument, but we wanna think about this idea is that it's a natural setting, that this naturally emerges from the market structure where we have really big upfront costs and then constant uh, marginal costs or, or just kind of smaller marginal costs thereafter so that the average total cost curve is in general reducing it's downward sloping in the relevant area of production. Another type of barrier to entry is switching costs. So we can think of switching costs as kind of this lock-in cost. You lock in once a product is chosen to that type of product. The search or startup technological costs of switching to another firm are so great that you just really end up with this kind of barrier to entry. You end up with this situation where a lot of people aren't going to want to switch, right? You're not going to want to switch the type of service or you're not going to want to switch the type of good that you're consuming because you've already become familiar with this type of good. 
you've already have this kind of startup cost of using this type of good. A lot of times we can think of network goods as a certain type, a certain class of goods that have high switching costs as well, that we kind of lock into using one type of a product. So you can think of many online social uh, websites that have this kind of network effect to it that are network goods. One of the most famous examples would be the Facebook website, right? The value increases with the number of consumers using it. It's a network good, right? A good whose value increases as the number of cr consumers using it increases is a network good. You're getting more benefits as more people use it. Well, if I had some competitive uh, firm that was trying to be a, a secondary Facebook, it would be really hard for me to start up and compete with Facebook because there's these massive switching costs. Because it's a network good, if five people are using my new version of Facebook, nobody's really gonna want to use my version. They're gonna stick to the one where we have millions of people already involved there. And so you're actually connecting with the people you'd like to connect with and you're not going to face this cost of switching on over. Another type of barrier to entry is product differentiation. This is a situation where products that are somewhat similar uh, could be seen as unique or special for some certain, certain reason. So if we have some kind of distinction between the goods, we no longer have this homogenous good that we're competing over, and we have this imperfect substitutability across varieties of the product and therefore your product might be somehow seen as a little bit distinct and that causes a barrier to entry that causes a situation where you have some market power in your little niche however your product is actually seen so even though we compete in the same market all consumers might not see it that way they might not see it as perfect substitutes and thus, I have a little bit of market power uh, from having this a little bit of uniqueness. A fourth type would be a control of a key input. So we have control of some resource or maybe a secret formula, some kind of absolute cost advantage from controlling a key input or a, a, a scarce resource, right? Um, so this can be a common type of barrier to entry. A fifth and final type of barrier to entry could be an official government regulated barrier to entry. So you can think of uh, situations where the government regulates a certain industry and says only these firms can produce or only firms that meet certain requirements can produce or they create a situation where uh, only a certain amount of firms can have access to a medallion say to produce such as was the taxi cab industry in New York City for a while um, or whatever it might be they might regulate the situation such that you have to meet certain standards or fit into something or buy into some program or explicitly state only these firms can produce in order to keep other firms out or in effect keeping other firms out in thinking about these different types of barriers to entry it's important to remember that these barriers to entry seldom last for forever companies find ways to develop com competition through non-identical products if the payoff is big enough if the market power provides a big payoff it is going to induce people to be competitive, to find new ways around, and to change the current situation. And so sometimes barriers to entry are temporary, but firms find a way, entrepreneurially discover new ways of getting around these barriers to entry or of serving the market in some other fashion. So barriers to entry are very important for creating this market power, but we also have to consider the fact that they might not last for forever.